Uh, welcome to Cambridge Forum. Uh, as has already been uh, disclosed to you, my name is Jim Sedanius, Professor of Psychology and African American Studies at Harvard University. Uh, we're here tonight to discuss Rob uh, Kirsbaum's book, Why Everyone Else is a Hypocrite. In this new book, evolutionary psychologist Kirsbaum challenges the traditional concept of the unified self. In his new thesis, the human mind is made up of domain-specific and specialized modules, each evolved by the processes of natural selection. While these modules sometimes work together seamlessly, when they don't, it can result in massively contradictory beliefs, vacillations between patience and impulsiveness, violations of our supposed moral principles, and overinflated views of ourselves. Um, it's due to this notion of this critique of the unified I rather than the contentious we, which leads him to the conclusion that it is perfectly natural for people to believe that everyone else is a hypocrite. Um, as some background, Rob was, uh, got his BA at Cor Cornell University. He received his PhD from the Center of Evolutionary Psychology at the University of California, Santa Barbara, did some postdoctoral work in experimental economics at the University of Arizona, did additional postdoc work in anthropology at UCLA and Caltech. In 2008, he won the Distinguished Scientific Award for Early Career Contribution from the Human Behavior and Evolutionary um, Society. As one of the editors of the journal uh, Evolutionary Psychology, he's been at the forefront of debates concerning this new field of evolutionary psychology and modularity. His new book, Why Everyone Else is a Hypocrite, Evolution and Modular Mind, challenges the current thinking within psychology and argues that the discipline of psychology really needs to adapt to this new notion uh, about deep evolution. So that being said, I will uh, welcome Rob to come up and welcome to Cambridge Forum, Rob Kirsten. Thanks for that really generous introduction. I appreciate it. I also want to thank Cambridge Forum for having me. And most of all, I want to thank you all for taking this opportunity to spend some time with me tonight. I appreciate your coming out tonight. What I want to do is talk a little bit about some ideas that I've been thinking about recently. And I guess by recently, I mean over the last 15 years. Um, and it really comes down to answering what I think is one of the most basic questions we can ask as psychologists. And that is, how is it that you can take stuff like neurons, which themselves are made of things like proteins, which are themselves made of things like molecules and atoms, which in themselves aren't really very smart, and yet you put these things together and what you get out of it is something which is really smart. The human mind is capable of true wonders, and it does all the interesting things that it does even though the bits and pieces it's composed of themselves aren't particularly smart. They're kind of dumb bits of matter. And what I want to do tonight is just talk about what I think is going to be an answer to that question. And in answering that question, I think it gives rise to an explanation for a host of other phenomena in addition to just the question of why people are smart. But before I give you the answer, I just want to sketch one kind of answer that I think is really, really bad. And I, I sketch it in, for a couple reasons. One is that I think implicit in much of what you see in psychology this answer is in there somewhere. The other one is that it takes me back to some days um, after, as Jim said, Cornell, but uh, before Santa Barbara, I spent a couple years working for Walt Disney World. Uh, and there was a just really great attraction called Cranium Command. And in this attraction, you're led inside the head of a 12-year-old boy. And in the attraction, the arc is that you have a little guy called a Cranium Commando, which is sort of a little audio animatronic figure. And he gets information from the different parts of the mind, the hypothalamus, and uh, from the different uh, systems. And he then runs the show. He's got a little control chair, and he has these buttons and levers. And he's sort of in charge. He's a little homunculus, a little head inside a head. 
And it works really well. The attraction's great. I would recommend it, except the attraction lost its sponsor and you can't see it anymore. But maybe someday it'll, it'll be back. But the point is that this has to be wrong. This can't be the way that minds get smart is by having an even smaller smart thing in there, right? You run into an infant regress problem because you have to answer the question, well, if Bobby, the teenager who's in, in the uh, attraction, is smart because of Buzzy, he's running the show, well, who's smart for Buzzy? Um, so that's not the right answer. And what I want to do is talk to you about the, what I think the right answer is. And I think the right answer to the question, why are people smart, is actually to be found in those little electronic devices that you all just silenced a second ago, which is smartphones. Smartphones are not really, really good phones. That is, they're not good at being phones. If your phone is like my phone, it drops calls. Sometimes it's hard to hear. Uh, you have to be in a particular place to use it. Smartphones are called smartphones not because they're good phones, but because they do a lot of different things. And the reason they can do a lot of different things is that they have these little things called applications. Little specialized devices, computational devices, programs, subroutines, that together make the smartphone a smart thing. And my claim is that your mind is like this too. There's no buzzy in there. Instead, there's a collection of applications with different jobs that are bundled together that, taken as a whole, give rise to what we think of as human intelligence. These applications are ones with which you're familiar. You have memory systems, you have the visual system, you have the auditory system, and so on. But importantly, from my point of view, you also have little applications which are designed around social life. You have systems in your head which cause you to deliver benefits to your offspring and your other close relatives, to build friendships and alliances, to uh, avoid certain kinds of things, getting into conflicts, avoiding uh, one of my colleagues does some work on incest avoidance, uh, to cause you to choose the right friends, the right mates, the right allies, the right groups to belong to, and so on. And my claim here is that what makes us smart social creatures is not in general being smart, but the aggregation of all these systems taken together. I want to illustrate these ideas starting sort of at the bottom and then with luck I'll build up to the top with the, with the few moments I have to, to share with you my, my remarks tonight. And I, I want you to think a little bit about an optical illusion. So I can't show you one since this is, um, this is all audio, uh, but I just want you thinking a little bit about drawing two parallel lines, one above the other, and now draw arrows on the top one that face inward and draw arrows on the bottom one that face outward. And if you're thinking about it right, what you've just drawn in your head is something called the mueller liar illusion. If you could actually see what you've just drawn in your mind, it would appear as though the two lines you initially drew to be exactly equal in length, they looked as though one was longer than the other. This is a well-known illusion. You've probably seen it from time to time. But I want you to think a little bit about what it means to be fooled by the thing that you yourself have just drawn. What that means is that some part of your head has the belief that the two lines are exactly equal in length. You just drew them yourself. No one's fooling you about it. There's another part of your head that has the, the perception, the sensation, that the two lines are unequal in length. Some part of your head believes, in air quotes, that the two lines are unequal links. What that's telling you is that it's very easy to show that the human mind can simultaneously maintain contradictory representations, contradictory beliefs in different formats, true, but contradictory beliefs about the very same thing. Another piece of this puzzle lies in the fact that we're all aware of various kinds of things in the world going on. We have a visual experience and so on. But there's all kinds of things that we don't know about. These are the sorts of ideas that have been recently popularized by uh, books such as Blink and, and others in which there's these kinds of decision processes that we're not aware of. There are some classic experiments in psychology. Again, some of you might have heard of these. You can show people, let's say, a set of uh, four pairs of pantyhose. This was some early work done in the 70s. And you can lay them out in a line. And for, for reasons that don't really matter, people in the study just like to choose the pair of pantyhose on the right side. You can give them identical pantyhose. They go for the one on the right. But then if you ask them to explain their choice, even though we as experimenters know that what guided their choice was the position of the pantyhose, what people will tell you is that it was some property of them. Well, I like the color. I like the way that one sort of looks in terms of its texture and so on. So what this is telling you is that there's some parts of your head that are doing various kinds of jobs, but you yourself don't have access to the causal pathway by which that decision was made. You can sort of think of this as some modules that are designed to make decisions, and then there's these other modules that are designed to justify those decisions or to talk to the social world, to give other people information about what you've done, even if you yourself don't know why it is that you've done what you've done. This is a potentially important, important idea because it applies to domains that go well beyond pantyhose. Uh, another set of, of um, 
Another line of research that people have done, and this will connect up to hypocrisy, is morality. In a series of experiments, people like John Haidt and others have given people little stories or vignettes about some kind of moral infraction. Uh, I think maybe I won't go through the details of, of them, uh, just th they're, they're the kinds of things which maybe you wouldn't talk about in polite company. Uh, maybe we'll get to those in the Q&A. <laughs> and you can ask people to just answer the question, is this or that thing wrong? And people can merrily answer the question, yeah, yeah, that person did that, that's a bad person. The, the, the act in question is a moral violation. And once again, just as in the pantyhose case, what you find is that people can't justify their decision. They'll make something up. They'll confabulate, is the, the word that you often see in this literature, but they can't actually articulate the principle on which their moral judgment is based. Now, what this is telling you is just as in the optical illusion case, what that suggests is that you have two separate modular systems. One is driving the moral judgment. I think of this as a moralistic condemnation system. In humans, we have an extremely active and well-developed moral condemnation system. We go around the world, we evaluate other people's behavior on this axis of wrongness, and we condemn them for doing bad things. But there's also living in, in a side, next to that, metaphorically, that is there's all these other modules in your head which are driving your own behavior. And sometimes those systems cause you to take advantage of certain kinds of opportunities in the world, even when those opportunities conflict with your stated moral views about what kinds of behavior is wrong. And so you can see that if you've got a modular system with some modules that condemn and some modules that be behave, that it's quite plausible that various kinds of behavior are going to be inconsistent with the articulated principles of morality that any given person has endorsed. And what I want to argue is that this very simple idea, the multi-component mind, very naturally gives rise to hypocrisy. In some sense, this leaves open the question that I sort of address in the title about why it is that, of course, you yourself don't think of yourself in this particular way. And what that sort of leads us to is another interesting feature of the way that we interact with the social world. One of the things that we find, again, in uh, experimental psychology uh, over the last 20, 30, 40 years is that people have various kinds of incorrect views about themselves. So if you ask people like me, college professors, where they stand in terms of their abilities in the classroom, roughly 80% of college professors say that they're above average in terms of their teaching abilities. Um, about, about half of us will say that we're in the top quartile or better. Now, obviously, here I am in, in Cambridge. I don't think anyone actually needs to be a statistical expert to know that there's something wrong about that. We can't all be above average. This isn't Lake, this isn't Lake Wobegon. Um, so what that, what that suggests is that people have overly optimistic views about themselves. And this includes their views about what's likely to happen to them. Um, and it, in a recursive way, it also actually is the case that many people think that they are less subject to these very biases than other people, which is just awesome. Um, <laughs> And what I want to say is that this isn't lying, right? So this isn't I intentionally mislead you. It's just a false belief, but it's a particular kind of false belief. We're evolved creatures going around the world trying to gain various sorts of advantage, deliver benefits to relatives, our allies, avoid getting punished by our, our enemies and so on. And people are making judgments about us all the time. And one source of judgments that people make are our own beliefs on, on the basis of which we act on, right? So if I believe that I am in fact an excellent instructor and you're trying to make an inference, and particularly if I seem sincere, this can be an advantage to me to have a false belief to the extent it persuades you and vice versa. And this is gonna be the key point to the extent that I have true beliefs about something that would be a disadvantage if, if you knew it, it can be very bad for that belief to be in my head in such a way that it leaks out into the world, that I act on the basis of it or I talk about it. What this means is just like Thomas Schelling showed, there's a value to what I would call, what he would call strategic ignorance. That is, I, by not knowing certain bad things about myself, I can prevent you from knowing it. And so this now leads us to the end of the story, which is that <clears throat> 
for reasons that I think are, are interesting and not as obvious as, they, they, as it seems they might be, we really don't like hypocrites. We don't like people who act in ways that are inconsistent with uh, their own stated moral beliefs. And so to some extent, it's useful not to be inconsistent because you don't want to suffer the social cost of being the person who is identified as an inconsistent individual. So that might suggest to you that, that everything I've said sort of has this extra caveat to it, which is, well, OK, people are going to be somewhat inconsistent, but that's going to be tamped down to the extent that you know people are punishing them in some sense for having been inconsistent. And so what I want to say actually takes me back to a, a, a joke about these two hikers who are in the woods, and they come across a bear. And the, one of the two hikers starts to put his sneakers on. And the other one says, why are you putting your sneakers on? I mean, you're fast, but you can't outrun a bear. And the guy says, look, I don't have to outrun the bear. I just have to outrun you. <laughs> when I'm trying to be consistent, all I have to do is be just as, as consistent that comes in under your radar. I just have to evade your inconsistency detection. One way I can do that is simply not to notice the own, the, my own ways in which I've been inconsistent, because that would risk leaking that information into the social world. So it is strategically good for me not to notice my inconsistencies, but by the same token, I want to condemn you for yours. Mm -hmm. So from your point of view and from my point of view, the strategic considerations and the modular architecture of the minds allows us all to think that the other people are hypocrites. And that essentially is the explanation for why everyone else is a hypocrite. <laughs> Thanks so much for your time. Okay, thank you. You've been uh, listening to Rob Kurzbaum discussing his book, Why Everyone Else is a Hypocrite, Evolution and the Modular Mind at Cambridge Forum. Before I turn the uh, audience loose on you, I just have a couple of questions I would like to ask you. Um, the first question is this notion of modularity. This is not an altogether new construct. And it was first proposed in 1983 by a uh, fellow by the name of Jerry Godar in a book called uh, The Modularity of Mind. And since, other, since then, other people have been thinking and talking about this modularity notion, people like Jerry Carruthers and your mentors, uh, Lita Cosmides and John Tooby. And so what I'd like you to do, Rob, for us is just, if you could briefly sketch the geography of modularity. How many different sub-theories of it are there? And where do you stand in this geography of modularity? Yeah, that's uh, an interesting question. And one of the things I think is important to recognize is that many of these ideas uh, have traces back to many people, all of whom I'm sure are quite a bit smarter than I am. And I, I absolutely want to give credit to them. I think that Fodor is a good example of, of a modularity theorist. Uh, the person who I sort of look to when I think about these issues is Marvin Minsky, uh, who in, in many ways, he had, I think, one of the kind of clearest accounts of modularity. Now, he used a different kind of metaphor. He, he talked about the society of mind, using the notion of little agents doing jobs in there. But on the... <laughs> On the basis of, I would say, the kind of historical development that Jim was talking about, it's true. You can identify a kind of spectrum of modularity theorists. People like Fodor would want to say, yeah, OK, there are specialized systems at the level of your senses, so your visual system and your auditory system. But then he says there's also these so-called central systems, which have some other properties, where they're very general as opposed to specialized. Um, to locate me in space, if you think about this as a, as a line, uh, I guess what I would say is start at any part of the line and then go in the direction of more modular and then keep going and basically never stop. Because <laughs> that, that's to say, I take a quite extreme position. For me, it sort of turtles all the way down is one way to put it. That, that I don't know what it means even to say that there's a, a, a mechanism that doesn't have a function. And then the question just becomes an empirical one. What are the nature of those functions? Some of these functions are going to be quote unquote high level. So for example, uh, we seem to have systems which are pretty good at mapping features from one domain to another. This is why we can do things like analogy and metaphor. Now that's a pretty high level function. But from, from my point of view, that's still a function. So yeah, I would say the space, the intellectual space, is 
is populated with people who have different views on this. And just to sort of to, to rope this off, there are some people for whom this isn't even an, an issue. People who do physiology and so forth, everything from their point of view is specialized. People who do vision, everything from their point of view has a function and it tends to be fairly narrow. The debates about modularity tend to get had when people are talking about either so-called high-level cognition, analogy, metaphor, and so on, or social processes, friendship, uh, mates, and so on. Um, given your thesis of what I'm going to call massive modularity, if I can do that, um, if that thesis is correct, um, then I'm wondering how we can regard uh, this notion of our unified consciousness that we all walk around with. We all feel that there's a kind of continuity between the I, the experience of self today and yesterday and last week and from childhood. So my question to you is, what is the necessity of having this notion of contiguous, conti continuous self? Why not simply experience this broken up modular sense of self? Why do we need this continuity that we in fact all have? Is it the press secretary of the mind, as you nicely put it? Or is it really just an artifact, a, a byproduct of the interaction between these module, modules. Yeah, that's a great question. And by, by great, what I really mean is that's the question that I, I usually hope people don't ask. Um, it's, it's the one that makes me blush a little bit. It, I, I like another uh, version of it. I was at a conference the other day, and someone had, was talking to me about these ideas. And he sort of looks at me, he says, he says yeah, but come on. <laughs> so, come on, because um, it does sort of seem like there's a unitary me in there. I have a couple sort of things I would say about that. I mean, my, my sense is that that's a, that it's a very tough question to answer. And I don't know the answer to that question. Um, what I would say is interesting. I was just also just on a on a little doing a program with Brian Green, and you know, physicists have talked recently a lot about a set of ideas which are just completely foreign to our intuitions. This notion that you can measure a particle's spin, charm, whatever it is over here, and instantaneously the other particle's spin, charm, or whatever it is has been determined. I don't actually know the physics here, but I know that if you do one thing, you can instantaneously cause the other thing to happen, which we have no way to think about that. And so when I think about the, the world as we kind of experience it, it seems to me plausible that our intuitions are extremely bad at giving us guidance into what turns out to be true. So I'm willing to say, look, it certainly feels like there's a me in here and I'm in charge and I'm the guy and I'm the same me that I was yesterday, that I am today and will be tomorrow. And there is this phenomenology of continuity. And whether that's a, a function, whether there's some role that plays or whether that just comes out of the kinds of processes that make up the mind, I'm not, I'm not really ready to take a strong position on that. Um, I, I do, I do uh, concede that there's something funny about this kind of thing. That, that is, how do you get something which is so riddled with components to feel so unitary? And there my sense is, look, it's really easy to do intuitive psychology to kind of predict people's behavior. If I know that you're cold and I know that you know where your coat is, I'm going to predict you're going to go into the room with your coat in it. But by the same token, it's really good to do intuitive physics, too. And it turns out that those intuitions are just wrong. They're bad scientific uh, explanations. And we need to look at what the data are telling us. And if the data points us in a direction that conflicts with our intuitions, I, I want to go with the data. Let's assume that you're right completely, um, that we are really, the mind consists of these semi-autonomous and unconscious modules running around doing their independent things that we're hardly aware of. Then for me, the question, one of the questions becomes, what implications does this model have for the sense of moral responsibility? If my modules are doing stuff that I'm hardly aware of, that I have no control over, is it then really okay, justifiable, to hold the press secretary of the mind morally responsible for immoral acts? When thinking about this, I like to consider the case of Siamese twins. So suppose you have Siamese twins, conjoined twins, and uh, I don't know, one, one is not just a Siamese, one's a narcoleptic, he falls asleep all the time. And the other one, while he's asleep, commits crimes. 
Um, and then they get caught, and uh, eventually you have to try them. And then you have this kind of problem, right, because you want to lock up the Siamese twin that, that intentionally did the bad thing. But if you do that, then you're going to punish the sleeping twin, who actually is completely innocent in this case. So if it's true that the, if, as you say, which I love the way you put it, let's assume you're 100% accurate, correct, and so on, which is, I think, an excellent assumption. Um, <laughs> Uh, then there is this funny thing where we're locking up innocent modules because there's no way that we can disentangle them. Now, I would say there's two sort of issues there. One is kind of a pragmatic issue, which is that, look, the legal system ought to uh, provide incentives so that people are less likely to do the bad things and more likely to do the good things. Uh, the other thing is, uh, well, I guess also pragmatic, which is that I don't actually know what the alternative is. My modules made me do it can't be exculpatory, right? So it had to be the case that no matter what you did, it was going to turn out to have been that something made you do it. Something physical in the world made you do it. And I, I wouldn't say it's exculpatory. I would say it does make these issues potentially complex, although I actually take the position that these issues were complex before modularity came around, that the notion of responsibility and so forth, particularly in the case of pathology or how do we even arbitrate bef between just bad decision-making and pathology, these things are tricky. But certainly the Siamese twin case indicates that, to me at least, that little thought experiment suggests that there's always this possibility of doing something funny in terms of punishing entities that are not the causal etiology of morally wrong behavior. Good question. Okay. Um, you're joining us at Cambridge Forum, and as we continue our discussion of why everyone else is a hypocrite with evolutionary psychologist uh, Rob Kirsbaum, um, I would like to turn over uh, additional questions to the floor. So let's take questions one at a time. If you guys could stand up in front of the microphone, make a little cue, and ask your questions. And Rob, you can sit anywhere or stand anywhere if you want to. So let's take the first question. Okay, Rob, I'm interested in how you would conceptualize within your framework people who are overly negative and critical of themselves, who constantly want to tell you about the bad things they did or their bad traits and things like that, who seem if anything, negatively hypocritical rather than positively hypocritical? Yeah, that's, a, that's an interesting question. I, I think, uh, I mean, the short answer to that is I, I'm not an expert in areas that you're sort of moving into, which is more of a clinical domain. So some of these things could potentially be pathologies, and, and, and so that would be something which I'd be reluctant to, to comment on. But uh, I do think there's a couple things worth commenting about. There's sometimes advantages to being bad at stuff. Uh, this might seem funny, but in the same way that there are advantages to being ignorant and wrong, um, when I'm bad at something, this gives people who want to you know, be my friend, ally, and so forth, a, a way to deliver benefits to me, which is to compensate for this, this particular thing. Um, I, on a personal note, I can tell you that I am perfectly happy to admit, I'm not proud of it exactly, but I'm happy to admit that when it comes to having a sense of direction and navigating, I'm just absolutely abysmal. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I still, you know, get lost in my own office, uh, which is tough because it's actually a square. So... Um, <laughs> Yeah, and, and that, to, to, from time to time, I think a little bit about how it is that I happen to be with someone who's pretty good at that sort of thing. And it makes her more valuable to me because it, she can compensate for this particular failing. Now, she has many, many other virtues. Um, so it's, it's really not that she compensates. But I do think that there is a sense in which advertising these kinds of deficits can be, um, in, in some ways, an invitation for people to compensate. I mean, certainly you see other, other ways in which people are very eager to deliver help to people who are in need. Now, not all the time. And of course, there's a lot of variation around that. Um, so I think, I think that these claims about, uh, about one's own limits, sometimes at least, might be able to be understood in this strategic context. Uh, there could be other, other reasons. I mean, po possibly you want to make sure that you're the one who, who tells someone that you're bad at something before they themselves find out. Somehow it doesn't feel quite as bad in that case, although I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to push that too hard. Um, but I, I think it's a really an interesting question. And uh, I would also say, as I sort of began my remarks, that certainly there would be amounts of negativity where you would start to wonder whether this is something that's strategic and valuable or it might be something which is, which is pathological. I certainly liked your analogy of the smartphone. And I was thinking as you were talking about that, that a smartphone in India has to have very different capabilities from a smartphone in Oklahoma. 
different cultures have different ways of perceiving how I act in the world. So I wondered if it's your thought that all brains have the same modules or if those modules are formed based on culture. Yes, yeah, so what, what I would say is that there is a human nature, but that human nature gets built up through cultural experiences. I think a good analogy is language, right? So there's this kind of language acquisition device, and this is a modular system, and as you're growing up, what this does is it identifies linguistic output from other people, right? So what, what people in the world are saying, syllables, sentences, and so on. And from those raw materials builds up a, a language production, comprehension and production system that's specific to those syllables, to that code, to, to those, rep, those kinds of symbols. And my view on modularity is going to be that this is just one of many cases in which these things get calibrated up. So I would say that there are some kinds of modular systems which are going to develop pretty similarly independent of culture. So for example, I think that something like a photoreceptor is just a module. It's just a little piece of the architecture with a function. It just turns electromagnetic radiation into a signal downstream. And my guess is that these things more or less are going to be independent of culture. But the morality system, of course, is on the other side of that, right? So uh, India is an interesting example. So here it's fine to eat hamburgers, but in India, obviously, you know, the active killing of, of a cow would be a, a, a moral violation. And so as a, as a moral creature in a world in which the mores, the particular rules might vary, I have to have a modular system which is sensitive to those sorts of pieces of information that other people are producing that tells me the kinds of things that are bad. One, so that I don't do them, and two, so that I can condemn other people when they do. I find uh, the idea of the um, press secretary of the brain and the idea of self-deception pretty compelling. I'm a law student, and I spend a lot of my day uh, reading opinions by judges where I think it's just basically extended um, soliloquies of that press secretary trying to explain something, some intuition that another module has. And what I'd like to know is what you think we can learn from the press secretary, if, especially if there are ever um, indicators that suggest that the press secretary is, is getting closer to the genuine sort of reasons that um, a module has come out the way it's come out. Yeah, so one thing I didn't do in my remarks was, was talk about this press secretary metaphor. So the, just to pay this out, the idea is that there's some part of your head that essentially has a job, which is to communicate with other people in the world. So this is the part uh, that, that is sort of generating explanations, particularly favorable explanations for your actions. And my claim is just like a normal press, secretar press secretary, they're often going to be better off if they don't know damaging information, and this, this is how it intersects with my story about, about hypocrisy. And so the press secretary really is a public relations system, where it's, its role is not to run the show, it's just to explain behavior or to manipulate behavior. And so that's sort of the, the idea for the press secretary. And just again, to go back to something that Jim remarked on earlier, these are ideas that go back, uh, Dan Dennett, for example, talk, talked about this, and some other people have had similar uh, ideas in, in sort of the, the last 20 years of cognitive science. And, you know, as this intersects with law, it's a really interesting question. I mean, one of, the, one of the things that is funny in a system in which one can use precedent is that the strategic choice of what counts as the precedent often can allow you to get to where you want to go. Now, I'm not a legal scholar. So from the outside, it, it certainly often seems to me as though there's this funny thing in which somehow the precedent is chosen such that it intersects with the outcome that the particular person might, for some other reason that we don't necessarily know, uh, wants to advance in terms adjudicating the case and this you know this is a kind of another one of these tough things the world is complicated yes but the legal world is really complicated with tons of rules and the thing about law is that just like in our head as far as I can tell there's nothing that requires a legal system to be mutually consistent in the let in, in, in terms of the legislation which means that you have this problem in spades which is that you can if it's true that you have two contradictory uh, precedents or, or piece of legislation that could bear on a question, once again, the person who's adjudicating the case is, is potentially going to be able to uh, use the one that's advantageous. I don't know exactly what to do about that or how to think about that or how you could know when the press secretary is doing its job. I mean, clearly contradictions is one of them. Um, it, it seems to me that if you can identify ways in which a particular individual is uh, using precedent in one case that leads to the outcome they want, and then a different one, even even when there's 
structural similarities, then that's some good indication that there's some propaganda going on. But this is another, so this is the second tough question where I feel like I'm punting on a little bit. The other one was, you know, the whole consciousness thing, um, which is pretty, pretty tricky. I, I, you know, this is one of these problems, again, which just derives from the fact that when the world's complicated, I, I think it helps to have a lot of minds pouring over these decisions, which they do, depending on the level of the, juris, of, of the uh, jurisprudence. But um, be, beyond that, I, I think it's, it's, it's very difficult. If everything, if everything is modular, uh, what about uh, the sense of self and the mind being, say, uh, another module that has been uh, built up of synapse, uh, synapses over the, um, over the uh, extended period of one's life as a, as a set of, a sort of repository with long-term memory as a, a, you know, a, t a totally separate module? Yeah, I mean, I think that whatever consciousness is, it's going to be the product of one or more of these modular systems. I mean, and certainly being some consistency over the course of development is useful. I have a slightly different view. I mean, so a part of what I think is that minds have this problem, which is that if you consist of a lot of different components and there's lots of different adaptive problems and so a lot of different challenges that might come up and a lot of different opportunities that come up, arbitrating about over which one you should pay attention to at the particular moment, what you ought to do in the context of all the different things that are impinging on your nervous system is hard. And in some sense, what you need is a common currency. So if I have to, I don't know, uh, if I... Um, you know, have to worry about lots of different things that could go wrong. When something goes very wrong, I need to attend to it. But I also might be confronted with something which is even worse. So I think about the case with, you know, let's say somebody with a sprained ankle running from a bear, just to continue with the bear riff. So on the, on the one hand, you know, if you sprained your ankle, you sort of want to keep the weight off. And there's some expected value associated with, with you know, continuing to walk even on uh, a bad ankle of some kind of catastrophic problem, right? And somehow you have to try to weigh that against the value of running away from a bear, which in this particular example is very clear and obvious, right? In case there's listeners at home, you, you want to just tough it out and run away from the bear. Um, but, but it's not obvious to me that all the problems are going to be like this. And so maybe the thing that Jim's uh, sort of identifying as a sense of unitariness is really just what happens if you have, a common, have to have a common currency for decision making. So how do I decide which is more important? Well, all I have is sort of this sense of meanness. And I just do the most urgent me thing that's happening right now. And this is where I think you can start to sketch an answer to, the, to this question about what binds us all together, is modular systems that have to make decisions in which the costs and benefits of various kinds of actions are in extremely different currencies. Right? So if I'm hungry and I've got a sprained ankle, that's a trickier one. right? So well, it depends. How hungry are you? That's just an index of how, you know, how many calories you might, might need or how close you are to starving or whatever. Um, and so this hungerness has to fight against the painness. And how do you arbitrate that decision? Well, maybe what's going on in this sense of self that we have is just what it feels like for all those different things to have to make a decision with very different kinds of um, opportunities and costs and benefits in the world that we're trying to navigate. But I don't know. How do you account for the fact that sometimes people are not hypocrites? Um, in particular, uh, they recognize perhaps very quickly after performing an act that it is inconsistent with their, with their uh, values. Uh, of course, it, it may well happen that other people weigh that fact in on them, but even if that doesn't happen, for example, in the case of committing an act of cowardice, you might feel shame almost immediately afterward. Uh, what's the machinery for that? So there, there were actually a couple, I, I would distinguish those two questions. So one is why are people not always hypocrites? And the other one is after having done something bad, why do we have these emotions associated with the badness? I would separate those two. Let me take the first one first. I mean, there's lots of ways in which I don't want to be a hypocrite. So there are lots of things I morally condemn that I myself don't want to do. And I allow, I'll, I'll let your imagination run wild. Think of all the things that are simultaneously disgusting and morally wrong. Right, and you probably would condemn. Again, just gonna 
well, maybe I'll indulge in just one. Look, no one thinks you should have sex with chickens, okay? I'll just go ahead and say it. <laughs> but there's no sense in which, it, it, so I also morally condemn sex with chickens, at least let me just suppose for the moment that I do. Um, I have no interest in being inconsistent with that particular aspect of moral condemnation. Uh, not, not into the chicken thing. So, so, so there's a case where, okay, well, the consistency is easy because a lot of moral rules adhere to stuff I don't want to do in the first place. Um, and I think that, so let me add another one. So now there's some stuff that I do want to do, right? So, um, you know, I was, I, I was here in Cambridge this morning and I couldn't quite figure out if the, the table that I wanted to sit at was available or not. There's sort of a cup of coffee that had about a half an inch coffee left in it. And it wasn't clear if that meant I'm coming back to the table to drink that cup of coffee or it just meant I didn't feel like busting my my little uh, coffee cup. There was a little thing where you put your dishes. And I thought, oh, this is, a, this is a bad person who, when they left, they didn't establish whether or not they felt as though they had a continued property right over the table and left that clear. And inevitably, you know where this is going. I'm getting up, and of course, I didn't think twice about leaving my coffee cup on the table, but I did go back and get it. But what's the point? The point is that, look, it's a benefit not to take care of these little things. We're all busy. We've got stuff to do. We'd rather not clean up after ourselves if we know someone else is going to do it for us. And we condemn people who don't do that. And so there's a case in which uh, there's hypocrisy. But, but even, even if that weren't the case, we also tend not to want to do things or we, we choose not to do things for which people will morally condemn us. When these things are codified in law, we don't do it in part because we don't want to go to jail or be fined or whatever it is. Other things we don't do because we don't want to suffer social censure. So we stay consistent in some sense by virtue of relatively lawful parameters of these problems having to do with a lack of interest in doing uh, morally condemned, condemned things and potentially a lack of uh, interest in getting morally condemned for doing them. So that's one thing. The second question that you asked is, is, a, is different. So why is it that after you, feel, after you do something bad, you, you sort of signal that you, you, you feel bad about it? And there I do think it's a signal function, which is to say, look, I know that I think you should be brave. I was a coward. And I am acknowledging the fact that I have done this thing that does not conform to my values and potentially the values of the world around you around me. And so, and I think that there is a reparative function, a social reparative function associated with this kind of signaling. This is why they have characteristic body configurations, right? So shame, sort of you get to be really small. Um, and there's facial expressions that are associated with these sorts of things too. So whenever you see stuff like this in the, in the non-human animal world, people very clearly would say this is a signal so that Organisms are transferring some information about the representation of my internal state to people in the audience. In humans, I think it's exactly the same. Darwin thought this as well. And so what I would say is that, yeah, doing things that are bad potentially has cost, but you could at least reduce those by signaling I acknowledge it, and partially by acknowledging it, what you're communicating to the rest of the world is, if this comes up again, I'll do it right. And that makes you a valuable social person. Have you done any studies on the pleasure that many people seem to get by the transgression of personal morality? So they're very aware that they may condemn other people for you know, doing bad things in the world, as you said. And even themselves, they, don't, they profess not to want to do these things. And yet, when they actually, almost the physiology of doing that transgression there's a pleasure that comes from it. And so it's almost like this kick of addiction. These two, and it's because one of the things that you were talking about is the lack of awareness between the modules, let's say. But it seems to me that people are pretty aware when they're you know, transgressing the, when they're trying to justify something that they know was morally wrong, but they get pleasure out of their transgression. So the, the short answer to your question, which, which if I remember correctly, and I'm pretty sure I do, began with, have you done any studies on? So I can very briefly answer that with a no. Uh, but I do want to engage the, the substance of the question. It's really interesting. People certainly do get a bit of a buzz off of doing these things which are, are wrong. I think that's, in some sense, what you're talking about. There's something visceral and pleasurable yeah, about, about doing things that are wrong. And I, it's kind of interesting. I mean, there's lots of things that people find pleasurable that are slightly peculiar, right? So people strap a piece of fabric on their back and jump out of a perfectly good airplane, uh, and they find that pretty pleasurable. That's weird. Um, 
people lock themselves into cars that other people have, you know, designed to be relatively safe, and then they kind of do loop de loops, and then that's weird. Uh, there's, there's there's all sorts of sorts of things which are strange, and this is holding aside the issue of recreational drugs and so forth, which is sort of picking your pleasure centers. You know, I, this, there is something about the way that we're wired that gives rise to these interesting phenomenological experiences, which can be intense, and the valence sometimes can be funny. It seems like it ought to be negative, but somehow it's positive. It ought to be terrifying to jump out of a plane, and yet people find it somehow well. Maybe it's simultaneously terrifying and there's some other phenomenological experience. I find it very interesting. Uh, but as for the explanation for it, I'm not really sure. I, I, I would challenge the notion that at least the modal individual gets a positive rush out of violating a moral norm for its own sake. I, I find it very, very, very tough when I'm, when I'm aware of it. And I'm sure there's a little bit of cultural variation on this. And w even within cultures, then there's inter-individual variation. Um, I, you know, certainly if you asked a British person, do you, do, you get, do you get a rush out of cutting in line or in the queue? I think they would just sort of be <laughs> outraged at the notion. Um, and so, uh, sorry, I just having gotten, just gotten back from London and seen just the famous queuing. It's just really an inspiration. Um, so, some, sometimes I think they would queue for fun if they could. Um, <laughs> Uh, so, so I, I guess I would say, yeah, people seem to some to some extent get a, a kind of enjoyment out of these violations, but I also would say that look, the the normal thing that happens, I think, the canonical thing that happens, is that the anticipation of the negative feeling that one would get from doing these things stops the modal person from doing it, and it is it's actually the reverse. And so, what you're pointing to really is an interesting mystery. Um, the question I have really is sort of how do you um, take this concept of modularity and think about developmental psychology and sort of neuroscience and how the prefrontal cortex allegedly is happening later. And so are some of these modules, um, is, there, is there such a thing as uh, developmental modularity or something like that? Yeah, that's a great question. And I mean, the short answer is absolutely. So my my sense is that uh, I mean, as you say, one, one thing that's happened recently in neuroscience is that people have gotten a lot better developmentally uh, understanding which structures come in early, come in late, and as you're indicating, the frontal stuff seems to be uh, something that comes in late. And one of my colleagues at the University of Pennsylvania has been thinking a lot about this and what are the functional advantages, potentially, of letting the frontal cortex develop later. And certainly, I would agree with you that the one of the useful ways to think about modularity in the in, in terms of moving forward, linking it up, is going to be ha it's going to have to be linked up both to developmental and neuroscience, and then, of course, the union of those two, developmental neuroscience. Um, and But my sense is that, and, and to some extent, there's various pieces of this that we already have a pretty good sense of. So the visual system, for example, has been well studied, and it's not perfectly understood yet, but certainly we have a pretty good sense of how those cells organize one another and how those different components start to get fitted together over the course of development. Um, so. I myself, I'm not particularly, I'm not doing research in that area. I'm not trained either in the developmental developmental psychology or in neuroscience. I do think that these levels, in the ideal world, they're, they're going to be mutually informative. Uh, and there's a little bit of an asymmetry that I just want to point out. So when I talk about modularity, it's easy for people to think that I had, kind of have in mind something like a Lego system, a spatial modularity, but I don't. I, what I want to talk about is functional modularity. And I do think about this in the context of smartphones. I mean, if you tried to drill a hole through your smartphone and take out only the Angry Birds application, you couldn't, you couldn't possibly do it, right? Because the physical, the electronics and the programming doesn't respect physical space, right? It's, I, like, I think Steve Pinker has this remark where he talks about modules being spread out through the mind like roadkill. Um, so it's just sort of everywhere, you know, kind of these, these, you can have a functional module that kind of gets everywhere, but by the same token, you have a little bit of, of the reverse, which is that when you see stuff that's really spatially localized, that oftentimes people are using that as evidence of functional specialization. Again, you see this in the visual system, right? So there's a, a, a whole set of systems in the back of your head uh, that seem to be very clearly implicated in vision and only vision. And people have used that spatial localization to make the argument about the job of the system uh, that, uh, that, that's going on right there. Yeah. Um, I, I'd like to raise the issue of social ethics and how your view um, colors, or helps us color that. Uh, <clears throat> I understand you essentially start with the point that there is the um, 
So the individual self that then looks into the world from which you make decisions. But some of the decisions may be socially bad, for example, racism or oppression of poor people. Uh, and uh, we as a country have tried hard uh, in many ways to overcome those by passing laws which create uh, equal opportunity and create voting rights for people who are dispossessed. So I'm trying to find out uh, what, to, uh, what to come away from your thinking about how, how your thinking impacts social ethics. That's, that's a pretty big question, um, and I'm happy to take a little bit of a stab at it. The, the evolutionary view very broadly suggests that organisms are designed in such a way that they have systems in their head, which are the ones that were built by genes that were selected that led to their own replication over time. That doesn't mean we're all going to turn out to be selfish in the very narrow sense of that term, right? So we all love our mothers and our children and our brothers, and we love our friends, and we sacrifice things for them. By the same token, of course, Given that you have these evolved creatures, we all have different interests, and so we're trying to bring about different states of affairs in the world. And so there are many problems that are raised by having organisms that are designed the way we are, trying to uh, all live in the same sort of environment, and so laws and so on are part of that. And some of those laws generate public goods, right? Uh, and some of them are ones that differentially benefit some to the benefit of others, and to, to some extent, what we would like to do is have principles that minimize the second kind of rule and maximize the first kind of rules that, that, that lead to aggregate welfare benefits uh, to society and minimize the extent to which people are manipulating uh, the legislative process to benefit themselves and their allies and, and their kin and so on. And, you know, there's no perfect system. What, what I would say about that, and, and one of the things that I think a little bit about is that we have a set of principles by which we try to live, on which the country was founded, having to do with freedom and, and sharing and so on. And I would argue that at least it seems to me that to return to this notion of inconsistency, there are ways in which our, our legislatures at all levels, in my opinion, behave in ways that are inconsistent with the founding principles of not just our democracy but other democracies as well. Many of us, I think, would take the position that legislatures ought not to pass laws that prevent people from doing things that they enjoy as long as those things don't harm other people. This, I take it, is what we, what we mean when we talk about liberty. And yet, I would also argue that there are plenty of rules that we have on our, our current books that prevent people from doing things that they enjoy quite a bit, even though those things don't harm other people. And the inconsistency between these foundational principles and the way that they're implemented is something which I think this view suggests that we ought to take more careful account of and think carefully about whether particular rules have this property that they might be inconsistent with, with the kind of meta rules that we have for, for passing laws. I, I don't think there's a clean answer to your question. I mean, if, I, if we had a clean answer to that question, then... Uh, we would probably have better institutions. I'm not saying the ones we have aren't aren't good. Um, since this is being recorded, <laughs> love the American institutions. <laughs> Which isn't to say there isn't isn't room for improvement, but it does also suggest that there's room for reflection. But you know, it's it's true that um, that people work very hard to end to end some of the things that you're talking about, but. I mean, again, the world, is, the world is complicated. And I would also say that just like natural selection leads to some unintended consequences, legislation can lead to unintended consequences. So people with extremely good intentions can produce extremely unpleasant outcomes. And I think this is not just the case for you know, legislation. It's true in economics. It's true in politics. Um, it's true in environmental interventions and so on. So... You know, I think that the, the lesson there is just when you have complicated systems like heads and polities, you have to have a certain amount of humility and that it's definitely the case that you can have people working for good outcomes, but there's always going to be the introduction of outcomes that, that are the result of complexity which aren't necessarily going to, going to be foreseeable. Now, if this is all an unconscious 
decision, and there's just an ex and they sort of justify it with that. One, is there a genetic component in this to certain people would be considered morally born, you know, morally uh, born along a moral level and other people are not because of the weight of these different modules on the subconscious president? So my, my sort of initial reaction to that is that, you know, there's a species typical human nature, and it's true that there's some genetic variation, but by and large, there is a kind of a makeup to what it means to be human, and the, the genes that we have interact with our developmental environments, whether it's the physical environment or the social environment or any other part of it, the chemical environment, and so on. And, and so I think that the kind of variation that one sees in genetics, I mean, this is a little bit of a, a case in where you start to get into some issues that are contentious in the literature. I, I take the view that genetic differences among individuals tend not to be particularly important. That, that is to say, natural selection tends to weed out genetic variation that's relevant to adaptive problems. And this is simply because you can think of natural selection as just sifting through different genes and picking the, the ones that are better than others. And if there is one that's better than the other ones, it's going to keep picking that one over and over. That's just what it means for a gene to be better. So what that's going to do is it's going to suppress variation that's sort of relevant to some of these big fitness problems. And then what you're going to be left is, is a lot of, some genetic noise around stuff that doesn't matter as much. So hair color and eye color. I'm going to say this even though it's being recorded personality. Uh, to, to me, is this sort of potentially an expression of a certain amount of genetic noise. Uh, and so you get this kind of, I mean, not, not to say personality research isn't interesting, important. I, I definitely think it is, um, particularly research into these, these heritable components where the differences are due to differences in genes. But certainly, I, would, I definitely would resist the notion that there's going to be some sort of set of moral genes that are going to cause some people to be more than others. And, and, and I'm, I would even say, I'm not even sure that I would know how to measure that. What I would say is that you know people put different weights on different sorts of things. Some people, and, and this was sort of a, an earlier point, some people seem to get a charge out of violating moral rules. Some people find it very aversive. And so this is going to lead to systematic individual differences. Where do those come from? I'm not really sure. Some of it could be, could be in the genome. Um, again, my sense is that tr you know, traits are an, an interaction between genes and environment, and, and the origin of that variation is going to have to be arbitrated for any given trait that you're talking about on an individual basis. And I think for something like morality, it's one of these complex things where it's not even going to be an answer. You're going to have to define it down a little bit more closely and then do a whole bunch of work to start getting towards an answer. Um, so I know that's not particularly satisfying. It's, it's sort of a, it's complicated, but it is complicated. I mean, the relationship between, I mean, human nature is, is a tough thing. And even if there was a completely hom homogeneous genome, if we were all sort of genetically identical, put us in all these different environments, you're still going to see a tremendous amount of individual differences. We know that uh, from, from uh, the fact that not all differences are heritable. They're not due to differences in genes. They're due to differences in environments. So what that's telling us is that you know, I, would, I wouldn't look to the genome for the causal locus or the kinds of variation that I think you're, you're looking for, which isn't to deny that there might be, might be some interesting individual differences that are lo located in genetic differences. Yeah, so empathy is an interesting one. I mean, so, but uh, yeah, there are some individual differences, but again, I, I, I'm thinking about some of the recent work where my colleague out in California, Paul Zach, has been looking at the hormone oxytocin. And so there you do see some genetic variation in some of the receptors having to do with oxytocin. And then you might say, well, that, that sort of bubbles up. So you get variation in some of the neural, some, some of these uh, receptor systems, and that sort of leads to differences in empathy and so on. I, I would be cautious there again, though. I, I really don't, I wouldn't reject out of hand the notion that many differences in some of these even really important individual difference variables are going to come from developmental experiences. I mean, the developmental experience of, of people is really complicated. I mean, there's peers and there's parents and there's food and there's pathogens. And the notion that any one of these things can push around various elements of our psychology, I find extremely plausible. So this is actually somewhat related to the last question uh, regarding genetics, but at risk of overgeneralizing, uh, instead of genetics, maybe enrolled gender. Um, a lot of studies have been done where women may communicate more relationally, and I could see that the press secretary might communicate and organize the modules differently than a, than a man might. 
um, not necessarily better or worse, but have you done any studies or do you agree that the press secretary might handle that differently? It's always interesting thinking about uh, gender differences here, sitting right next to Harvard University. <laughs> Give... uh, but I'm not going to punt. Uh, I would be, um, I would, I would be shocked if it. It would be as an evolutionist psychologist. I would be shocked if it turned out that human male brains, human female brains, didn't systematically differ, given that. Uh, by virtue of the way that our, our mating system works, they face different adaptive problems. And one would expect the reliable development of uh, different s sorts, that these modular systems very well could be organized in a different way. Now, having said that, many of the things that we've talked about here tonight or that I've tried to address, I actually think are probably, are going to. I would say they're unlikely to be all that different in the sense that the kinds of problems that we face as humans, whether male humans or female humans, in the context of kind of the propaganda system, how we can manipulate other people to think very well of us, these are pretty similar, independent of who you are, that is, which, which sex you happen to be. And from that, I take it that one might guess that, yeah, there's going to be some differences, particularly, ob obviously, in the, in the things that surround issues of, uh, of sex, and, and that, that's true. But in these very broad strokes, my, my guess would be that these systems are fairly likely to develop relatively consistently. Again, I'm not trying to deny that there's going to be some systematic differences, but certainly in terms of the, the press secretary system, the propaganda system, ultimately the function of that system is to broadcast ideas that cause other people to have the most favorable image of, of me possible, given the limits of plausibility. And if you, when you frame it that way, then sure, there's going to be stuff that's going to differ between men and women. So men are going to focus on different things in terms of what makes them valuable because men and women are valued for different, different things. But in terms of these very basic strategic elements, my sense is that there's going to be a, a pretty good amount of homogeneity, that you're going to have to go down into the tasks that differ by sex before you start seeing modular differences by sex. And that's going to get into stuff like mating and, and there's some other sorts of things about, about friendship networks and so on, where how the different sexes manage their social dynamics are, are going to push around these different modular systems. Uh, hello. Uh, other than knowing that, as a teacher, that you are probably average, uh, what, what would you say to teachers uh, who may want to apply some of your ideas in the classroom? Yeah, I, I think that's a tricky question. I mean, my sense of what the most, I mean, it depends on what level, I think, in, in general. But one thing that my preparation, when, when, as I've been reading the material that surrounds this, is is that it, the way I sort of put it is that all psychology is local, uh, which is to say that it, there's incredible context effects. And so, for example, you know, um, one, of the, one of the things that has been happening, I've been giving some interest, some talks, I hope they're interesting, but it's interesting in the sense that sometimes you have a mix of undergraduates, graduate students, faculty, and so on. And what I find is that, and this is with all due respect, and I'm not making a blanket comment about undergraduates, for the record, a lot of heterogeneity, but they don't seem to be able to avoid checking their cell phones every couple of minutes. <laughs> there's, I think of this as, you know, there's, I'm not going to say there is a uh, Facebook wall posting module check, you know, or whatever, but it certainly seems as though you can sort of think of the various things in the environment as temptations that distract. And my sense is that one of the things that, that I've sort of incorporated into my teaching um, is to think a little bit about the extent to which I reduce the probability that people are going to be tempted. Now, it's tricky because in the modern environment, what happens is people want to bring their laptops. And on the one hand, you sort of say, oh, that's good, so they can write down my notes. Uh, on the other hand, maybe they're not writing down what it is that I'm saying. Um, and, and so what I would say is that w one thing that what happens in a modular mind is that the modules are constantly on the lookout for things that sort of satisfy their little modular preferences. I think of this really, I do actually think that there's modules that are designed to gather important socially relevant information. What's a Twitter feed or a Facebook post? Basically, this is often some social information that's relevant to me. Someone's saying something good about me or identifying some fact about somebody else or whatever it is that people do these days in the social network media. I say that as though I don't do it, but I do. Um, 
you got to be careful here because, you know, inconsistencies somehow seem so much worse than they used to now. Um, <laughs> so I would say that, that understanding that distractions is a really big thing. And I think this is one of the things that's going on with ADD. ADD seems to be, I just like to keep switching tasks because something else is, is more. Now, I'm not a clinician. I'm not saying that on the record. My sense is that you can think of people who are engaged in these activities as a sort of being constantly being told by some much, oh, there might be some piece of information over here, or this thing I'm doing, not really thrilling me, but you know what, I could be doing this other thing. And so these modular systems, I think, can be tamed by carefully considering the kind of environment in which people are learning to reduce the probability that they're going to be tempted. I mean, I myself do all the things that you see in this literature on, on commitment, sometimes called pre-commitment, which I find redundant, pre-commitment, just commitment, right? Um, where you do, do things like if I've got a paper to write, I kind of flip off the um, internet thing on my laptop so that I can't, I can't check email, I can't do other stuff, and so I've got, all I've got to do is that thing. And I think that, and I find it very effective, actually. So the, the so me right now can change the options of the me five minutes from now by preventing him from using his internet. And the me right now can really screw that other guy over. Um, but it's, it's for his own good. And I think that these kinds of lessons are potentially valuable for creating educational environments that allow the kind of concentration that are necessary for uh, sustained learning. So the term of evolutionary psychology is very intriguing. Uh, but Darwin uh, came up with uh, evolution theory based on observation by animals. Is there the hip hypocrisy among uh, in the animal kingdom? Yeah, that's that's a really interesting question. Um, but the answer is no, uh, and I'll tell you why I think that. So it, it has to do with the sneaky way that I define <laughs> hypocrisy. So my, my view is that morality is something which is distinctly human. And I know that a lot of people care a lot about that claim, but let me be careful. I'm not saying that some people have sort of con con conflated, in my view, cooperation and morality. So when I say morality, what I mean is the evaluation of acts on a right-wrong dimension. So for example, you know, if you look at the kinds of organisms that uh, you know, are, are relatives of ours, and I'm going to hold aside chimpanzees, and I'm going to hold aside macaques for the moment. But by and large, if you know, we were all, I don't know, uh, orangutans, and you decided to bop another orangutan over the head, and I wasn't a relative of either one of you, I really wouldn't care. Organisms inflict costs on one another all the time, and third-party observers do not care. Uh, and this is really different from humans. We really care. When uh, I would really care a lot if you decided to hit someone over the head with a baseball bat, um, and probably everyone else here would too. And so, so if that's true, if if you and again, I'm going to hold aside a couple of creatures, and I'll just ask you to let me have a few, just a few species that I can hold aside. Um, then it's going to be true that essentially there's no moral condemnation among these non-humans. And because of the way that I've defined hypocrisy, it's the combination of condemning X and doing X. And so if that's the case, if there's no condemnation, you can't get hypocrisy. Now, that's not to say there aren't other kinds of inconsistencies. Organisms can be drawn into doing things which, at least on some kind of theory, do look somewhat inconsistent. Uh, and you have to kind of mess around with their environments a little bit. But you can get them to do things which... which to some extent, suggest underlying computations that aren't quite in sync. But, but I would hold that aside from hypocrisy, that is to say, this, this technical meaning that I want to assign to it. Don't get me wrong. If other organisms morally condemned behaviors, then I would say it would be shocking to me if it turned out that there wasn't hypocrisy. And that has to do with this very argument that I've been making, which is that all cognitive architectures from evolved creatures, because they consist of a lot of evolved pieces, there's nothing necessarily that's going to keep them consistent with one another. So in some sense, it's the default state. It's the state of nature to have inconsistencies. The only way you suppress it is by having control systems, which kind of are just specifically designed to tamp those things down. I know that your, your thesis is somewhat controversial, as is the whole field of evolutionary psychology. But if suddenly the field adopted your view, where do you see it leading? What would you like to see next? I think that one of the ways in which this ch changes the game for at least some 
parts of the discipline is that it switches how you think about the weird things people do. The current model is basically what I would call a folk psychological model. So when you ask why do people have these inflated views of their teaching abilities, the usual answer among social scientists is always located in self-esteem. Well, I like to feel good about myself, so I think good things about myself. And when I think a good thing about myself, I feel good and QED. And um, I, I think of this as sort of, I think of it in the context of uh, ostriches. When, you know, there's this, there's this myth, and it is, it is a myth, that when ostriches see something scary, they bury their heads in the sand. Uh, now, it's true that if you were an ostrich and you saw something about to, you know, run up and eat you, it could be that if you stick your head in the sand for those last few seconds of life, it might feel pretty good and calm and peaceful and so on, right up until, ah, you know, that gets you. Um, and this is the way I think about the models of false beliefs, which is that, yeah, it feels good, but it's not very functional. And so the way that it changes the discipline is that instead of starting by asking the question, how does this help the person feel good, you start by asking a different question, which is, how does this accomplish the strategic goals that an evolved organism might have? So I would say that the way it changes the discipline is it changes the very way that you frame the kind of question that you want to ask from how do I get happy to how do I you know, manipulate other people? How do I solve some, some adaptive problem? And then I think the kinds of answers you're going to come up with are very different. Now, the answers that I propose could very well be wrong. I mean, you know, the fact of the matter is most science is going to turn out to be wrong. I mean, it's particularly science like social psychology that, or the, the social sciences broadly. You know, we are still confused about pretty much everything. And so while I think that frameworks are useful and valuable for moving things forward, the individual answers we propose, you know, 50 years from now, they're going to say, wow, that was, that was not too bright. Um, and we have, we have to be okay with that. But I do think that, that switching the perspective here from a kind of folk approach to these kinds of questions, to a functional approach to this question, changes the nature of the answer. So that maybe we'll get the individual answers wrong, but it'll at least it'll be a kind of answer that will be closer to what's going to turn out to be to the truth. And so that, that's what I see the real marginal advantage is, stepping back, changing the whole framing, so that the kind of question is a functional one as opposed to a folk psychological one. Any other questions? Um, first of all, I just wanted to thank you for transitioning from using gender to sex a couple questions ago. I think that's an important distinction, so thank you for that. I would be curious to hear more about um, your and your colleagues' research on sort of big-ticket immoral issues. What happens when someone is committing um, something such as incest of a minor or murder when it's so obviously wrong? You know, sirens should be going off. Are they choosing um, one part of the brain to, to control? Is it, is it dissonance? Is there a level of cognition and choice? Or is there an incentive system that adapts morality? So, so I want to thank you for thanking me uh, for switching. <laughs> Um, so I, I should say, I actually, uh, g gender is a word I tend to shy away from. I, I might have been sort of uh, a little bit sloppy there, and I apologize. But yeah, no, I'm biological. So I, as a sort of someone who's couched in biology, I know what sex means. I, have, I don't know what, I don't always know what gender means, but so fair enough. Um, but to answer your, your question, uh, it's the last thing you said, incentive. So the thing is, it seems to me that decision-making organisms have to make decisions and modular systems have this interesting feature, which is that different modular systems can sort of vote on what's going to happen, but ultimately some decision has to get made by the behaving organism. So, you know, uh, I'm faced with my partner and they're having sex with another guy and I have one system that says you should kill that guy because for all the usual reasons associated with, you know, sexually reproducing creatures. And there's another module that's saying, hmm, you know, uh, there's going to be costs. There's some probabilistic, you know, you know, you're going to get caught and punished and so on. And, but ultimately I've got to do one of those, one of those two things. And one of them's got to win. And so the last thing you said was incentives. I think that what's going on there is that these different modular systems, they pull, push and pull depending on the context and depending on the history and depending on the state of the organism, which means that the science of decision making has to be really complicated. Because if it's true that you can't predict my decision in any given context unless you know the relevant features of the environment, the history of my particular self, that is 
the bounded entity that is me, um, and my state, right? So it could have anything to do with my current, you know, degree of hunger or thirst or whatever. Th then, if you can't predict what I'm going to do absent all of those kinds of parameters, well, then decision making is going to turn out to be complicated. But in the end, some system is going to have to get stuck not doing kind of what it's designed to do. So if I inhibit the revenge system, then the revenge system has been stymied. If I don't inhibit the revenge system, the system designed to keep me out of long-term trouble by virtue of moralistic punishment, that one's going to be stymied. The, the problem with having a modular system is that these guys can't all win, right? You can't flee from a predator and be foraging at the same time. You can't, you know, engage in mutually incompatible uh, tasks. And so, yeah, it's got to be that there's some kind of a voting system or whatever it is. My guess is it has to do with the way that these systems get activated and mutually inhibit one another and ultimately guide behavior. And I think this is the challenge as people studying decision making is to recognize that if it's true that you've got all these modules do doing what they're going to do and you have to get to an understanding of prediction, and then you're not going to make good you're not going to be able to build really good models until you have a good sense of all the different ways in which your predictions turn on all these different parameters any other questions all right well before we end i just have one question for you rob and uh, it's a two part question uh, it deals with um, moralistic modules in your book you argue that the function of moralistic modules is really to benefit the fitness, the fitness uh, interests of the individual carrying those um, modules. And I'm thinking about um, recreational drugs as one example of um, an area which people condemn and laws are passed against uh, and behaviors which don't directly have any negative consequences for others. So my question is, one, um, how can we build an argument for the fitness benefits of such kind, that, that kind of module? And two, how can we come up with an answer to that question that does not lead us uh, into developing some kind of just st so storytelling? So uh, the example that you raise is actually one that I got quite interested in, and so I've done some research on this question, and I know that it's, we've been here for a while, but I'm going to sketch the answer. It'll just take about three minutes. Um, the, the, the idea here is that moral rules sometimes have effects on other people's behavior that can be just a little bit subtle, uh, and that you've got to really look for what's really going on. And in the case of illegal drugs, um, the, the work that we're, we're doing starts with an argument about going back to sex, it's basically the idea is suppose you have an organism that can have two different life history strategies. So there's some males and what they're going to do is they're going to find a mate and invest in, in offspring. We're going to call those guys dads. And there's another kind of male and what they do is they just try to have lots of different matings but they don't invest in offspring. They devote all their effort to mating effort. We're going to call those guys cads. Not, not, not to prejudge the moral issue, but just for the rhyme with dads, because you've got dads and cads. Um, and now suppose it was also true that there's various kinds of moral rules, and those moral rules are going to affect how well I can implement my strategy depending on if I'm a dad or a cad. So in a world in which, for example, it's very, very difficult to be promiscuous because we moralize promiscuity, that is, we punish people who are promiscuous, it's hard to be a cad. Now, on the other hand, in a world in which it's easy to be promiscuous, it's actually bad for dads because dad's biggest fitness threat has to do with um, the probability that they're going to be with someone who winds up mating with another individual and you raise somebody else's young. So and if you don't like thinking about this in humans, just think about this as, as a bird model. And then it should, be, it should be much less aversive to think about these things. If you have, a, you have kind of a daddy bird, it, what it really wants to do is avoid mommy bird going off and having an affair. And if you're a sexy bird, right, you want to make sure you can have a lot of affairs. Um, so if it's true that people associate recreational drug use with sex, with pr promiscuity, and as an empirical matter that seems to be the case, then you might expect that people who are pursuing a monogamous strategy uh, are going to oppose the use of recreational drugs, and people who are not engaging in this kind of monogamous strategy will not. And the way that we keep it away from having an, an, a just so, so, just story is that we make predictions, which can then be tested. So we've run some studies in which we get people's views on, on casual sex, and we get people's views on drugs, and then we also have compared this to the model 
uh, which is, I'm sure, near and dear to your heart, which comes from political science and uh, political psychology. I say that because uh, Jim Sidenius listeners ought to know uh, one of the foremost political s- psychologists of our day. Um, so he's quite familiar with these ideas. Uh, so we, we tested these two models against each other. And essentially what we find is that you can, if you want to know whether or not someone's opposed to recreational drug, the best question you can ask them, other than do you oppose the use of recreational drugs, which is probably the most straightforward way to go, but still, um, you c- should ask them uh, about their uh, sexual history. You know, now that I'm saying this out loud, it doesn't really sound like that great an idea, but um, <laughs> you just only try this at home, I guess. Uh, and it, it turns out that the best predictor of people's opposition to recreational drug is, is their sociosexuality, how pr- promis- promiscuous they are, how many sexual partners they've had in the last two years, whether or not they think sex without love is okay. Um, and what we think is that people are using these moral rules to constrain other people's sexual behavior. And this goes back to another question about how uh, we relate in a democracy such as ours. So people are using these rules, we think, to constrain other people's behavior to advance their fitness interests, even though they don't even know how they're doing it. You just have this intuition about the opposition to illegal drugs, and that has the effect, potentially, of advancing your fitness interests in an abstract sense. And again, people don't know where this intuition comes from. And how can we stop this? Well, I mean, it's a great question. And again, it goes back to an earlier remark. You know, we're supposed to have rules in this country that say you can't make laws that stop people from doing stuff if it doesn't hurt anyone else. I think that was the whole point of, you know, fighting against the British who had, you know, really nice tea rituals, which we've somehow lost in the course of history, which is kind of a shame. Um, and, and so I think, you know, we need to look at these rules and say, we have a set of principles on which we ought to be legislating. And to the extent that the legislation conflicts with these principles, this is an area where I think we need to devote a lot more our, of our attention as a polity, as people who are participants in a, in a, a representative democracy. And so in some sense, the real lesson about hypocrisy is that Moral principles aren't just there to constrain our own behavior. They're there to constrain the very rules under which we operate as a society. That was a great answer, Rob. Thank Thank you. you. Okay, you've been listening to the program Cambridge Forum, recorded on March 21st, 2011, co-sponsored by the First Parish, in Cambridge, the Unitarian Universalist, the Lowell Institute, and the Friends of Cambridge Forum. For a CD of this uh, forum entitled, Why Everyone Else is a Hypocrite, featuring Rob Kurspan, or for additional information about our forum network webcasts, visit at cambridgeforum.org. In Harvard Square, I'm James Sedanius, thanking you for participating. Thank you very much, and good night. Thank you.